The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne, Part Three, Chapter Three. The night passed without incident. The colonists were on the qui vive, and did not leave their post at the chimneys. The pirates, on their side, did not appear to have made any attempt to land. Since the last shots fired at Ayrton, not a report, not even a sound, had betrayed the presence of the brig in the neighborhood of the island. It might have been fancied that she had weighed anchor, thinking that she had to deal with her match, and had left the coast. But it was no such thing, and when day began to dawn, the settlers could see a confused mass through the morning mist. It was the Speedy. "'These, my friends,' said the engineer, "'are the arrangements which appear to me best to make before the fog completely clears away. It hides us from the eyes of the pirates, and we can act without attracting their attention. The most important thing is, that the convicts should believe that the inhabitants of the island are numerous, and consequently capable of resisting them. I therefore propose that we divide into three parties, the first of which shall be posted at the chimneys, the second at the mouth of the Mercy. As to the third, I think it would be best to place it on the islet, so as to prevent, or at all events delay, any attempt at landing." We have the use of two rifles and four muskets. Each of us will be armed, and as we are amply provided with powder and shot, we need not spare our fire. We have nothing to fear from the muskets, nor even from the guns of the brig. What can they do against these rocks? And as we shall not fire from the windows of Granite House, the pirates will not think of causing irreparable damage by throwing shell against it. What is to be feared is— the necessity of meeting hand to hand, since the convicts have numbers on their side. We must therefore try to prevent them from landing, but without discovering ourselves. Therefore do not economize the ammunition. Fire often, but with a sure aim. We have each eight or ten enemies to kill, and they must be killed." Cyrus Harding had clearly represented their situation although he spoke in the calmest voice, as if it was a question of directing a piece of work and not ordering a battle. His companions approved these arrangements without even uttering a word. There was nothing more to be done but for each to take his place before the fog should be completely dissipated. Neb and Pencroft immediately ascended to Granite House and brought back a sufficient quantity of ammunition. Gideon Spillett and Ayrton, both very good marksmen, were armed with the two rifles, which carried nearly a mile. The four other muskets were divided among Harding, Neb, Pegcroft, and Herbert. The posts were arranged in the following manner. Cyrus Harding and Herbert remained in ambush at the chimneys, thus commanding the shore to the foot of Granite House. Gideon Spilett and Neb crouched among the rocks at the mouth of the Mercy, from which the drawbridges had been raised, so as to prevent any one from crossing in a boat or landing on the opposite shore. As to Ayrton and Pencroft, they shoved off in the boat and prepared to cross the channel and to take up two separate stations on the islet. In this way, shots being fired from four different points at once, the convicts would be led to believe that the island was both largely peopled and strongly defended. In the event of a landing being effected without their having been able to prevent it, and also if they saw that they were on the point of being cut off by the brig's boat, Ayrton and Pencroft were to return in their boat to the shore and proceed towards the threatened spot. Before starting to occupy their posts, the colonists for the last time wrung each other's hands. Pencroft succeeded in controlling himself sufficiently to suppress his emotion when he embraced Herbert, his boy, and then they separated. In a few moments Harding and Herbert on one side, the reporter and Neb on the other, had disappeared behind the rocks, and five minutes later Ayrton and Pencroft, having without difficulty crossed the channel, disembarked on the islet, and concealed themselves in the clefts of its eastern shore. None of them could have been seen, 
for they themselves could scarcely distinguish the brig in the fog. It was half-past six in the morning. Soon the fog began to clear away, and the topmasts of the brig issued from the vapour. For some minutes great masses rolled over the surface of the sea. Then a breeze sprang up, which rapidly dispelled the mists. The Speedy now appeared in full view, with a spring on her cable, her head to the north, presenting her larboard side to the island. Just as Harding had calculated, she was not more than a mile and a quarter from the coast. The sinister black flag floated from the peak. The engineer, with his telescope, could see that the four guns on board were pointed at the island. They were evidently ready to fire at a moment's notice. In the meanwhile the Speedy remained silent. About thirty pirates could be seen moving on the deck. A few more on the poop, two others posted in the shrouds, and armed with spy-glasses, were attentively surveying the island. Certainly Bob Harvey and his crew would not be able easily to give an account of what had happened during the night on board the brig. Had this half-naked man who had forced the door of the powder magazine, and with whom they had struggled, who had six times discharged his revolver at them, who had killed one and wounded two others, escaped their shot? Had he been able to swim to shore? Whence did he come? What had been his object? Had his design really been to blow up the brig, as Bob Harvey had thought? All this must be confused enough to the convicts' minds. But what they could no longer doubt was that the unknown island before which the Speedy had cast anchor was inhabited, and that there was, perhaps, a numerous colony ready to defend it. And yet no one was to be seen, neither on the shore nor on the heights. The beach appeared to be absolutely deserted. At any rate there was no trace of dwellings. Had the inhabitants fled into the interior? Thus probably the pirate captain reasoned, and doubtless, like a prudent man, he wished to reconnoitre the locality before he allowed his men to venture there. During an hour and a half, no indication of attack or landing could be observed on board the brig. Evidently Bob Harvey was hesitating. Even with his strongest telescopes he could not have perceived one of the settlers crouched among the rocks. It was not even probable that his attention had been awakened by the screen of green branches and creepers hiding the windows of Granite House, and showing rather conspicuously on the bare rock. Indeed, how could he imagine that a dwelling was hollowed out at that height in the solid granite? From Claw Cape to the Mandible Capes, in all the extent of Union Bay, there was nothing to lead him to suppose that the island was or could be inhabited. At eight o'clock, however, the colonists observed a movement on board the Speedy. A boat was lowered, and seven men jumped into her. They were armed with muskets. One took the yoke lines, four others the oars, and the two others, kneeling in the bows, ready to fire, reconnoitred the island. Their object was no doubt to make an examination, but not to land, for in the latter case they would have come in larger numbers. The pirates from their lookout could have seen that the coast was sheltered by an islet, separated from it by a channel half a mile in width. However, it was soon evident to Cyrus Harding, on observing the direction followed by the boat, that they would not attempt to penetrate into the channel but would land on the islet. Pencroft and Ayrton, each hidden in a narrow cleft of the rock, saw them coming directly towards them, and waited till they were within range. The boat advanced with extreme caution. The oars only dipped into the water at long intervals. It could now be seen that one of the convicts held a lead line in his hand, and that he wished to fathom the depth of the channel hollowed out by the current of the Mercy. This showed that it was Bob Harvey's intention to bring his brig as near as possible to the coast. About thirty pirates, scattered in the rigging, followed every movement of the boat, 
and took the bearings of certain landmarks which would allow them to approach without danger. The boat was not more than two cables lengths off the islet when she stopped. The man at the tiller stood up and looked for the best place at which to land. At that moment two shots were heard. Smoke curled up from among the rocks of the islet. The man at the helm and the man with the lead line fell backwards into the boat. Ayrton's and Pencroft's balls had struck them both at the same moment. Almost immediately a louder report was heard. A cloud of smoke issued from the brig's side, and a ball, striking the summit of the rock which sheltered Ayrton and Pencroft, made it fly in splinters, but the two marksmen remained unhurt. Horrible imprecations burst from the boat, which immediately continued its way. The man who had been at the tiller was replaced by one of his comrades, and the oars were rapidly plunged into the water. However, instead of returning on board as might have been expected, the boat coasted along the islet so as to round its southern point. The pirates pulled vigorously at their oars that they might get out of range of the bullets. They advanced to within five cable lengths of that part of the shore terminated by Flotsam Point, and after having rounded it in a semicircular line, still protected by the brig's guns, they proceeded towards the mouth of the Mercy. Their evident intention was to penetrate into the channel, and cut off the colonists posted on the islet in such a way that whatever their number might be, being placed between the fire from the boat and the fire from the brig, they would find themselves in a very disadvantageous position. A quarter of an hour passed while the boat advanced in this direction. Absolute silence, perfect calm reigned in the air and on the water. Pencroft and Ayrton, although they knew they ran the risk of being cut off, had not left their post, both that they did not wish to show themselves as yet to their assailants, and expose themselves to the Speedy's guns, and that they relied on Neb and Gideon Spilett, watching at the mouth of the river, and on Cyrus Harding and Herbert, in ambush among the rocks at the chimneys. Twenty minutes after the first shots were fired, the boat was less than two cable lengths off the Mercy. As the tide was beginning to rise with its accustomed violence, caused by the narrowness of the straits, the pirates were drawn towards the river, and it was only by dint of hard rowing that they were able to keep in the middle of the channel. But as they were passing within good range of the mouth of the Mercy, two balls saluted them, and two more of their number were laid in the bottom of the boat. Neb and Spilett had not missed their aim. The brig immediately sent a second ball on the post betrayed by the smoke, but without any other result than that of splintering the rock. The boat now contained only three able men. Carried on by the current, it shot through the channel with the rapidity of an arrow, passed before Harding and Herbert, who, not thinking it within range, withheld their fire. Then, rounding the northern point of the islet with the two remaining oars, they pulled towards the brig. Hitherto the settlers had nothing to complain of. Their adversaries had certainly had the worst of it. The latter already counted four men seriously wounded, if not dead. They, on the contrary, unwounded, had not missed a shot. If the pirates continued to attack them in this way, if they renewed their attempt to land by means of a boat, they could be destroyed one by one. It was now seen how advantageous the engineers' arrangements had been. The pirates would think that they had to deal with numerous and well-armed adversaries, whom they could not easily get the better of. Half an hour passed before the boat, having to pull against the current, could get alongside the speedy. Frightful cries were heard when they returned on board with the wounded, and two or three guns were fired, with no results. But now about a dozen other convicts, maddened with rage, and possibly by the effect of the evening's potations, threw themselves into the boat. A second boat was also lowered, in which eight men took their places, and while the first pulled straight for the islet, to dislodge the colonists from thence, the second maneuvered so as to force the entrance of the Mercy. 
The situation was evidently becoming very dangerous for Pencroft and Ayrton, and they saw that they must regain the mainland. However, they waited till the first boat was within range, when two well-directed balls threw its crew into disorder. Then Pencroft and Ayrton, abandoning their posts, under fire from the dozen muskets, ran across the island at full speed, jumped into their boat, crossed the channel at the moment the second boat reached the southern end, and ran to hide themselves in the chimneys. They had scarcely rejoined Cyrus Harding and Herbert before the islet was overrun with pirates in every direction. Almost at the same moment fresh reports resounded from the Mercy Station, to which the second boat was rapidly approaching. Two out of the eight men who manned her were mortally wounded by Gideon Spilett and Neb, and the boat herself, carried irresistibly on to the reefs, was stove in at the mouth of the Mercy. But the six survivors, holding their muskets above their heads to preserve them from contact with the water, managed to land on the right bank of the river. Then, finding they were exposed to the fire of the ambush there, they fled in the direction of Flotsam Point, out of range of the balls. The actual situation was this. On the islet were a dozen convicts, of whom some were no doubt wounded, but who had still a boat at their disposal. On the island were six, but who could not by any possibility reach Granite House, as they could not cross the river, all the bridges being raised. Hallo! exclaimed Pencroft, as he rushed into the chimneys. Hallo, Captain! What do you think of it now? I think, answered the engineer, that the combat will now take a new form for it cannot be supposed that the convicts will be so foolish as to remain in a position so unfavourable for them. "'They won't cross the channel,' said the sailor. "'Ayrton and Mr. Spilett's rifles are there to prevent them. You know that they carry more than a mile.' "'No doubt,' replied Herbert. "'But what can two rifles do against the brig's guns?' "'Well, the brig isn't in the channel yet, I fancy,' said Pencroft. "'But suppose she does come there,' said Harding. "'That's impossible, for she would risk running aground and being lost.' "'It is possible,' said Ayrton. "'The convicts might profit by the high tide to enter the channel. With the risk of grounding at low tide, it is true. But then, under the fire from her guns, our posts would be no longer tenable. "'Confound them!' exclaimed Pencroft. It really seems as if the blackguards were preparing to weigh anchor. Perhaps we should be obliged to take refuge in Granite House, observed Herbert. We must wait, answered Cyrus Harding. But Mr. Spilett and Neb, said Pencroft, they will know when it is best to rejoin us. Be ready, Ayrton. It is yours and Spilett's rifles which must speak now. It was only too true. The Speedy was beginning to weigh her anchor, and her intention was evidently to approach the islet. The tide would be rising for an hour and a half, and the ebb current, being already weakened, it would be easy for the brig to advance. But as to entering the channel, Pencroft, contrary to Ayrton's opinion, could not believe that she would dare to attempt it. In the meanwhile, the pirates who occupied the islet had gradually advanced to the opposite shore, and were now only separated from the mainland by the channel. Being armed with muskets alone, they could do no harm to the settlers, in ambush at the chimneys and the mouth of the Mercy, but, not knowing the latter to be supplied with long-range rifles, they on their side did not believe themselves to be exposed. Quite uncovered, therefore, they surveyed the islet and examined the shore. Their illusion was of short duration. Ayrton's and Gideon Spilett's rifles then spoke, and no doubt imparted some very disagreeable intelligence to two of the convicts, for they fell backwards. Then there was a general helter-skelter. The ten others, not even stopping to pick up their dead or wounded companions, fled to the other side of the islet, tumbled into the boat which had brought them, 
and pulled away with all their strength. Eight less! exclaimed Pencroft. Really, one would have thought that Mr. Spillett and Ayrton had given the word to fire together. Gentlemen, said Ayrton, as he reloaded his gun, this is becoming more serious. The brig is making sail. The anchor is weighed! exclaimed Pencroft. Yes, and she is already moving. In fact, they could distinctly hear the creaking of the windlass. The speedy was at first held by her anchor. Then, when that had been raised, she began to drift towards the shore. The wind was blowing from the sea. The jib and the fore-topsail were hoisted, and the vessel gradually approached the island. From the two posts of the Mercy and the Chimneys they watched her without giving a sign of life, but not without some emotion. What could be more terrible for the colonists than to be exposed, at a short distance, to the brig's guns, without being able to reply with any effect? How could they then prevent the pirates from landing? Cyrus Harding felt this strongly and he asked himself what it would be possible to do. Before long he would be called upon for his determination. But what was it to be? To shut themselves up in Granite House, to be besieged there, to remain there for weeks, for months even, since they had an abundance of provisions? So far good, but after that! The pirates would not the less be masters of the island which they would ravage at their pleasure, and in time they would end by having their revenge on the prisoners in Granite House. However, one chance yet remained. It was that Bob Harvey, after all, would not venture his ship into the channel, and that he would keep outside the islet. He would be still separated from the coast by half a mile, and at that distance his shot could not be very destructive. Never, repeated Pencroft. Bob Harvey will never, if he is a good seaman, enter that channel. He knows well that it would risk the brig if the sea got up ever so little. And what would become of him without his vessel? In the meanwhile the brig approached the islet, and it could be seen that she was endeavouring to make the lower end. The breeze was light, and as the current had then lost much of its force, Bob Harvey had absolute command over his vessel. The route previously followed by the boats had allowed her to reconnoitre the channel, and she boldly entered it. The pirate's design was now only too evident. He wished to bring her broadside to bear on the chimneys, and from there to reply with shell and ball to the shot which had till then decimated her crew. Soon the Speedy reached the point of the islet. She rounded it with ease. The mainsail was braced up, and the brig, hugging the wind, stood across the mouth of the Mercy. "'The scoundrels! They are coming!' said Pencroft. At that moment Cyrus Harding, Ayrton, the sailor, and Herbert were rejoined by Neb and Gideon Spilett. The reporter and his companion had judged it best to abandon the post at the Mercy, from which they could do nothing against the ship, and they had acted wisely. It was better that the colonists should be together at the moment when they were about to engage in a decisive action. Gideon Spillin and Neb had arrived by dodging behind the rocks, though not without attracting a shower of bullets, which had not, however, reached them. Spill it! Neb! cried the engineer. You are not wounded? No answered the reporter, a few bruises only from the ricochet. But that cursed brig has entered the channel. Yes, replied Pencroft, and in ten minutes she will have anchored before Granite House. Have you formed any plan, Cyrus? asked the reporter. We must take refuge in Granite House while there is still time, and the convicts cannot see us. That is my opinion, too, replied Gideon Spilett but once shut up. We must be guided by circumstances, said the engineer. Let us be off, then, and make haste, said the reporter. Would you not wish, Captain, that Ayrton and I should remain here? 
asked the sailor. "'What would be the use of that, Pencroft?' replied Harding. "'No, we will not separate.' There was not a moment to be lost. The colonists left the chimneys. A bend of the cliff prevented them from being seen by those in the brig, but two or three reports, and the crash of bullets on the rock, told them that the Speedy was at no great distance. To spring into the lift, hoist themselves up to the door of Granite House, where Top and Jupe had been shut up since the evening before, to rush into the large room, was the work of a minute only. It was quite time, for the settlers, through the branches, could see the Speedy, surrounded with smoke, gliding up the channel. The firing was incessant, and shot from the four guns struck blindly, both on the mercy post, although it was not occupied, and on the chimneys. The rocks were splintered, and cheers accompanied each discharge. However, they were hoping that Granite House would be spared, thanks to Harding's precaution of concealing the windows, when a shot, piercing the door, penetrated into the passage. "'We are discovered!' exclaimed Pencroft. The colonists had not, perhaps, been seen, but it was certain that Bob Harvey had thought proper to send a ball through the suspected foliage which concealed that part of the cliff. Soon he redoubled his attack, when another ball, having torn away the leafy screen, disclosed a gaping aperture in the granite. The colonists' situation was desperate. Their retreat was discovered. They could not oppose any obstacle to these missiles, nor protect the stone which flew in splinters around them. There was nothing to be done but to take refuge in the upper passage of Granite House, and leave their dwelling to be devastated, when a deep roar was heard, followed by frightful cries. Cyrus Harding and his companion rushed to one of the windows. The brig, irresistibly raised on a sort of water-spout, had just split in two, and in less than ten seconds she was swallowed up with all her criminal crew. End of chapter.